<laughs> so, huh. five years ago, Ted tried a new way to do what it does so well, that is, to foster ideas worth spreading, ideas big enough to change the world. And so they organized the first Mission Blue in the Galapagos Islands aboard another National Geographic Lindblad vessel. <laughs> And here we are, five years later, in another part of the Pacific Ocean. And now the stars are lined up <laughs> in ways that have never been possible before. As never before in the history, we know what none who preceded us could know. It just gets better in that way as we learn more and understand more who we are, where we came from, and maybe most importantly, where we might be going in the future. It is something like a race. Can we learn enough soon enough to be able to keep pace with the changes that we have caused to the only place in the universe that's suitable to sustain us? So days, literally days after we returned from Mission Blue One from the Galapagos, <laughs> we got a wake-up call. I did, anyway. Most of the world did, because we could see our power to destroy. It wasn't intentional, but it happened. And it's just an example of the kind of power that humans have developed in a matter of, of a few hundred years to truly alter the nature of nature. It wasn't long thereafter that I had a chance to experience what it's like to swim in a changing ocean. In fact, this is a, just an example of a place near Cocos. It's a world heritage area. It's a hope spot. It is a place that is now awash in a river of plastic. We now see, even now, even though we know better, we're still extracting wildlife from the sea in ways that are clearly not sustainable. <laughs> Consider what we're doing to creatures that once thrived in the high seas, sometimes near the shore, swordfish. They're taken so relentlessly that they really get to grow up to be big swordfish. <laughs> Henry David Thoreau once commented many years ago, who hears the fishes when they cry? We need to think differently about our relationship to the ocean and the creatures who live there. We now know that the ocean drives climate and weather. We know that the ocean is the source, the fundamental underpinnings of our economy, of our health, our security, our life itself. But it's not just those issues. This we now should be looking at as a moral issue, an ethical issue. What are we doing? What are we doing to our mostly blue planet. So this is a glimpse of the Coral Sea, a place that I knew when it was as robust as what you were seeing here, what we are seeing here in this still intact, still beautiful part of the Pacific Ocean. There are lots of reasons for despair. Uh, the deeper you go in the ocean, you'd like to think the smaller our footprint is, but Things are changing. We're moving deeper into the ocean now with deep sea mining, not just deep sea fishing. It seems that wherever we can take ourselves, we go with the attitude of extracting from the very systems that keep us alive. Lots of reasons for despair, but you know what? There are plenty of reasons for hope as well. And that is what keeps me going, I think. It's just the idea that huh, it's not just all despair. <laughs> Plenty of reasons for hope. 
And this is the time, as never before, that not only we know what we have to do, but to actually get on the business of doing it. With knowing comes caring, and with caring, there really is hope that we can get it right. <laughs> After 10 years of analysis, the census of marine life that looked at the past and the present and the future of life in the sea came to the conclusion that it's not all doom and gloom. About half of the coral reefs around the world are in pretty good shape. About 10% of the sharks, the tunas, the groupers, the halibut, and other kinds of creatures, large and small, still remain, despite clear cutting of wildlife in the sea, mostly at a rate that is increasing in recent decades. But they're not all gone yet. We're beginning to look at the creatures in the ocean with new eyes, with new respect about who they are, what they are, and how they fit into the greater scheme of things. The greatest diversity of life on Earth is out there, down there, in the blue part of the planet. Each creature, every one of them, is essential to making the ocean what it is. I don't think there are any spare parts out there. They're all doing something that makes the planet function in ways that were in place long before humans arrived on the planet. For the little fish, the tiniest ones that have their little burrows and home places in the, in the reef, to the largest fish in the sea. And yet, huh, many people think of fish as, well, you know, fish. All 50 or not 25,000 or so different kinds of fish get labeled comprehensively as, as fish or more often as seafood. Fish and chips, fish chowder, catch of the day. <laughs> Rather like saying Kentucky Fried Birds, or uh, how about mammal burgers? <laughs> fish as economic units, as currency, not as living components to be treated with ethical, con ethical considerations as well as gastronomic considerations. Two years after the Galapagos expedition, I had a chance to reaffirm what I've learned after 10 times of living underwater for weeks at a time and thousands of hours of diving. What I learned within that time is a respect for life. A respect for life in the sea in ways that we have come to respect birds on the land and other creatures. Not enough, but the way we have yet to understand the nature of life in the sea. Getting to know them as the notion as a laboratory, living in the ocean, to see it from the standpoint of the creatures who actually live there, to become a sea creature. I mean, in a sense, we're all sea creatures anyway, as dependent on the ocean as any fish or whale or coral reef. But it's getting to be there and spend time with them to get to see them the way we have with many of the creatures on the land, to recognize that all, every fish has its own face. Every one of them has its own distinctive DNA, just like cats and dogs and humans and whatever. Now we're beginning to understand that these are wildlife, wild creatures, part of the planet that makes Earth what Earth is. So, the current pope, the Pope of Hope <laughs> suggests that maybe we should do unto others as others do unto us. Can you imagine doing that with fish? <laughs> or just suppose we, we listened to the ocean, listened to the fish, or thought about them in different ways. Of course, fish can't speak for themselves. It's up to those of us who can see them and speak for them. But what if we listened to the voice of the ocean? We have done so with whales. By the middle of the 20th century, after centuries of regarding whales as commodities, people began to see whales with new eyes. They began to listen to their songs. But for some, whales are still considered pieces of meat. 
just as many regard tuna, lobster, shrimp, and other wildlife in the sea as commodities or as currency, sometimes even as a source of sustenance. In the past, whales were mined from the ocean and threatened, treated as just goods, just the way many fish are today. But now we know what we could not know before, now that we've spent time actually exploring the ocean, getting to see it from the inside out and from high above. Now we know what no one could know <laughs> when I began exploring the ocean many years ago. New technologies enable us not only to see the world from high above, look at the ocean, look at the polar areas, but to document, to record, to measure, and to figure out what the consequences are of what we're doing to the planet. We now know that the planet is warming. The planet is changing. It's warming faster now than any time in human history. As Arctic ice melts, we can document it. We can measure it. We can plan, well, where is this going anyway? Good news for shipping, bad news for polar bears, bad news really for us. As the ice diminishes, the chances of survival for the creatures who live there naturally also diminishes. And our survival, chances for that diminish too. Now we know these things. Although it might seem that warming could be a good thing in some ways, there are consequences that relate to the warming and the melting of the ice owing to what we're doing to the planet that is driving right now, this year, this moment, while we're here in the Pacific Ocean, we're in the midst of the, of the greatest coral bleaching event that we've ever recorded. That's cause for concern, cause for hope that we know it exists. What if we didn't know this was happening or understand why it was happening or understand why storms are getting more frequent and more intense? But now, <laughs> through the technologies that enable us to understand the causes of many of the problems, excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in the ocean, we can now see solutions. Protecting the natural systems that not only extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but also emit oxygen that's vital to life as we know it. If you like to breathe, listen up. <laughs> Protecting mangroves, marshes, seagrass meadows. It's critically important to take care of these systems that keep us alive. In the ocean, small photosynthetic organisms hold the planet steady by capturing carbon, by emitting oxygen, by driving the great ocean food webs. It's important to take care of them, too. And there it is. Ocean food chain in action. The important thing when you get in the midst of something like this is not to actually become a part of the food chain in action. But what you can see is, okay, sunlight, photosynthesis, food, oxygen, right up the food chain to drive and power the great ocean predators and ultimately shape the character of the ocean chemistry. In the past five years, since Mission Blue One, there's been an increasing awakening to what we should have been aware and concerned about and what seems obvious when you think about it, that the oceans, the ocean and all that it holds is actually the most effective carbon capture and sequestration or storage system that exists or ever has existed. We now speak of blue carbon. What a concept. We know that trees are carbon capturing and storage units and we give carbon credits for trees. What about fish? What about dolphins and whales? What about all life in the sea? It's a living planet chock-a-block full of carbon-based units that hold the planet steady. We need to have new ways of thinking about the value of the creatures that are there. Of course it relates to climate change, just as natural systems on the land do as well. So, new technologies have come along. 
that have made possible access even to the deepest parts of the ocean. Now we can see the ocean and see ourselves with new perspective, new eyes, new understanding. Few systems currently exist to enable humans to go see them for themselves, the nature of what's below the surface. I mean, we can get down as divers, snorkelers, whatever, to the skin of the ocean, but the average depth is two and a half miles, and all of it matters, right down to the greatest depths, seven miles down. What are we thinking? You know, there are thousands of aircraft and thousands of millions of cars, millions of boats. How many submarines that enable us to see the other part of the planet that heretofore has not been accessible to us, but we have the technology. What we lack is the will to get down there and see for ourselves what lurks within the ocean itself. I mean, every scientist, every kid, every CEO, every president, every person, every citizen should have access to the blue part of the planet. All the way down, we go seven miles in the sky, what's keeping us from going regularly seven miles to the deep parts of the ocean? We need not just systems that can take us. Personally, although we certainly do need them, we also send our presence remotely into the sea. Harnessing the technologies that now exist that we could only dream about 50 years ago, we're dreaming about, but now they're here within our grasp. This is a moment in time as never before. And <laughs> here, here, maybe as never again, because things are changing fast. One thing that is exciting is to understand that nations do have jurisdiction now out beyond the land that we know and love as our countries. So, early this year, the United Nations, after years of deliberation, has finally agreed to a process that would make it possible to protect the high seas beyond national jurisdiction with an implementing agreement that can lead to, co to governance and ultimately protection of areas in the high seas that now, in a sense, are owned by everyone, but protected by no one. Island nations in the Pacific and globally have begun to exert their authority in their own exclusive economic zones to protect large areas of the ocean, securing their assets, giving marine life safe havens. Blue parks, I mean, what a concept. Early in the 20th century, this was an idea for the land. Now we're beginning to look at the ocean, including the deep ocean. We think of the ancient trees worth saving. How about the ancient corals that are thousands of years old? How about getting transportation systems that'll take us out to see the wondrous geological formations as well as the biological ones in the deep sea? An area that has been protected for 15 years is giving us cause for hope, that we can use our new insight, our new technologies, use our minds to grasp the significance of restoring places that have been depleted. Cabo Pomo is a beacon of hope. It had been fished, depleted to the point where, literally, there was little for the local people to catch. But here's the big idea. The people themselves sort of took note of the, of the need to protect and restore a place that was important to them. And soon after the Galapagos expedition in 2010, I had a chance for the first time to visit this place and then later 2012, most recently, earlier this year, to meet with Jeremy Jackson, who was on the first Mission Blue expedition, to conspire with him and the people who live there to see what could be done to enhance their hope for a place that now has been protected and with, with luck will continue to be protected, not just for the creatures who live in the sea, but for the people who live by the sea, and recognizing that literally all of us live by the sea. If we protect the ocean, we protect ourselves, of course, but it's only coming into focus right now that when you take action, 
you can go too far. We can have lost species. We have lost systems in the ocean. But if you come soon enough with protection, restoration is possible. So here's the plan to develop a global framework engaging people, communities, organizations, like Cabo Pomo, working with the local people, listening to them, and using their sense of caring about their future. And in partnership with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, that represents more than 100 governments and nearly a 1,000 organizations, represents people around the world with scientists, teams of scientists in 45 locations around the world to harness that framework and give people a place they can go to empower them to start the process to wind up eventually with official protection for the places they care about. Presently, more than a hundred places have been nominated as hope spots. And we need to be able to respond to that interest, to that love, to that hope. Actually, there are other ways, of course, other organizations are doing their part to protect the ocean. The National Geographic, with the pristine seas expeditions leading to protection, working with governments and working with people. 20 areas that are, have been identified as being in really good shape, worth protecting and some success has already been realized. Well, all of the pristine seas are hope spots. But hope spots don't have to be pristine. In fact, most of them aren't. They're places that with care can recover, like Cabo Pomo. It's an idea that is worth spreading, an idea that could change the world, embraced by people wherever they are. You know, there was a time we thought that we could do anything to the ocean that we wanted to, no problem. But now we know the ocean is not too big to fail. Now we know what our predecessors could not know. Plenty of reason for hope, but only if we act on what we know. We're living with policies that were set in motion sometimes hundreds of years ago. Ethical policies, dominion over over life on Earth, an attitude that we are the boss of the world. We're a part of the world. And it's our job as individuals who can now bring about change to cause hope for the future. As never before, we have a chance to do just that. 2012, at the UN conference in Rio, the headline was, what is the future we want. What's the future we really want? We have the power to shape it. But we have to hurry because there are tipping points that have begun to move beyond the point of no return. Can you imagine a world without sharks? Can you imagine an ocean without tuna, without coral reefs? Can you imagine a world without us? Ha! <laughs> Lots of things you can imagine. But I'd like to imagine a world with hope. This is a time when we have choices. We still can shape the future that we want. Protect the ocean as if our lives depend on it, because they do. Thank you.